namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de sang amatasa tawara ye soda one tab amunjan to satang. Here and now, this remembering the present is like this. Sati Kwamilik Cho in Thai to remember to remind yourself remember <clears throat> liberation is now <clears throat> freedom is now the end of suffering is now not about the future. So these are ways of using uh, these reflections to remind ourselves, keep remembering here and now. And in doing this, then we can be aware of, you know, the particular atmosphere we're in or our own mood, physical feelings in the present. Because here and now doesn't make any, doesn't say anything other than it's, it's a way of reminding ourselves to pay attention to the way it is. And the way it is is, you know, the, you know, the feelings you're having, the, the uh, external, internal, emotional, whatever conditions arise or are in consciousness at this moment. It's the way it is. You know, this is like reflection, puto tamo, noticing, observing at this moment, the kind of jitta, the, the mood of the mind is like this. Then training yourself with sound of silence is that this is a, I always, when I reflect in this way, the sound of silence becomes, is very strong. This is the tamarong, the ramana of emptiness, of non-self. If I don't notice this, if I can't, you know, I haven't quite recognized this, uh, what I refer to as sound of silence, or however you experience it, you know, it's, this is just the way I talk about it, then uh, you can reflect on the, maybe the particular mood you're in, the state of mind, whether you feel happy, sad, sleepy, alert, full of doubt and despair, full of hope, or anxious or worried or whatever. It's like this. Or the body in the present, in here and now, it's, ex it's existing in this present moment. These bodies are like this, sitting is like this. The four postures, iriyabhata, this is a, a basic reflection on the posture of the body in the present. It's like this. Breathing. Anapanasati. And this observer, then the puto, is not 
doesn't define it, it just notices. It's some, sometimes the, the mood that one notices has no name. You know, if it's an extreme mood, then it's easy. If you're upset or angry or uh, obsessed with something or whatever, then it, those, have, those are easy to label. But so much of daily life is neither nor. It's just like this, which has, we, we have no name for it. But you don't need to name it. In fact, don't name it. It is the way it is. Now, a lot of a lot of people, you know, and, <clears throat> and get they get confused about the subject object experience. If there's no self, if everything is anatta, then who's sitting here and who's observing this uh, the mood or you know because we're used to referring to a subject through the ego. I am my feelings, my body, my breathing, my mood. So that's how we interpret experiences through the, through the personality, through the habit tendencies, through identity, through attachment to them. So everything is about me and mine and how I feel. And this is on the worldly level, this is, uh, you know, how we talk in the world. But then in terms of Dhamma, we're letting go of the ego, you know, we're not interpreting experience through the ego anymore, but from the puto or mindfulness, panya, wisdom. So that's why these words, uh, Bhutang Sarnangachami, Dhammang Sarnangachami, Sankhang Sarnangachami, the three refuges, they're not, you know, just see them as, as uh, kind of gems. They're called triple gem. And of course, language, any religion uses superlatives. Gem is a, usually considered like a diamond, something precious. But they are. So this is this awareness then. This is what Bhutang Sarnangachami really means. It's not about something out there and taking refuge in some, some abstract idea of Buddha, Buddha nature or Buddha energy. It's, it's bringing it much closer than, than concepts of that nature, but it's, it's here and now. This is it. This awareness Sati, Sambhajanya. And then we, then we can see Dhamma. We know what, we, we see things through Dhamma rather than through uh, attachment to our feelings, to our bodies, to our memories. So this is, you know, this is the, the Buddha Dhamma. This, these are very skillful ways of thinking. Of reflect, we've got a very skillful way of using language with these uh, Pali teachings. Because one thing, they're you know they they are a, it's a it's a it's a vehicle for reflection. It's not for identity. It's not to become a Buddhist or anything like that. It's these are these are tools to use, skillful means to be able to see and understand reality, to awaken to the real.
Then Sankhang Sernangachami, when we usually use the word Supatipano, Uju Patipano, Nyanya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. This is, this is about Sangha, one who practices like this. The four pairs, the eight kinds of noble beings. Uh, this means that uh, this isn't about kind of Sotapanas and Arahants in the Himalayas or somewhere out there. Or to, you know, to think you have to become a Sotapanna or an Arahant. It's not like that. This is a different, different way of, of reflecting. And so when we take these terms from the ego level, they become uh, ridiculous. We try to figure, am I a Sotapanna yet or not? Now that's, that's an ego level interpretation of stream enterer, isn't it? Am I really a supatipano, ujupatipano? You know, that I, am I really, or I, maybe you're very arrogant, and I'm a real supatipano, or maybe you're a skeptic, and I don't know if I'm a, I've still, you know, have doubts and fears and But it's direct, uh, ujupatipano is direct, so this directness is, is observing the ego rather than coming from the ego. Knowing the sakaya ditti rather than inter continue interpreting even meditation in Buddhism from sakaya ditti. So we take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. From the ego level or from the wisdom level? And that's up to you. <laughs> I just offer this as a reflection. But the, the, say the Puto, Puto, the Buddha. When I when I think of Bhutang Ternangachami or Bhuto, just the the two syllable mantra Puto is it. You know, if you if you use this word properly <clears throat> for a, a reminder, it's like here and now Dhamma. Be aware, wake up, here and now. It's this kind of sati kwamar look, this, you know, remember this. Refuge in Buddha is like this. So when we come into the, you know, we have this temple with this uh, Buddha rupa. Learn how to use a Buddha rupa for that kind of recollection. No, you can look at it, the Buddha Rupa aesthetically, you know, either you like, think it's beautiful or not, or, you know, a critical mind, but that's not the point. Even a, a hideous Buddha Rupa is still useful. It's not about whether we like it or not, but it's learning how to use an icon skillfully for sati sampachanya satipanya. Now, refuge in Dhamma then is Santitiko, Akaliko, Hehi Pasko, Upanaiko, Bajatang, Vaitida, Poviniuhi. So, this is reflection on Dhamma. Apparent here and now, not tomorrow or next year. Apparent here and now. Timeless. Ehi Pasko, it's like an invitation. Come and see. Come and look, and it's like this, right here, right now. <laughs> Encouraging investigation is our translation, but it's a bit uh, 
you know, it doesn't have the same power of come and see. Because it is like a, a, an invitation. Wake up, look for yourself. Come and see. Open eye go. And then there's confusion around leading inwards or leading onwards, but it leads anyway. <clears throat> I mean, if you wake up and see, then it leads on to understanding, insight. Pajitang Vaitita Pawinui. To know it for yourself is not through believing in any in something called Dhamma anymore. You you know it. There's a direct knowing you awakened to the real. This awakening puto to reality, Dhamma. So then the, the subject-object relationship is no longer this divisive ego which sees everything, because the ego is very divisive. The thinking mind divides everything. The sense of I am Ajahn Sameh, I am this body, then it, this affirms the separation, the differences, the, that I have from you. It makes the differences, the, uh, you know, my reality. My ego, my sense of myself, what I like, what I don't like, my opinions and views, and so forth. This is my feelings. All these, well, you know, they're different. You know, we're not going to feel exactly the same thing at this moment. So if I operate from the feeling level, then, I, then I'm, you know, living in this, in this sangsara or this world of birth and death. The realm of death. I've been born into the realm of death because birth implies death. So if I'm going to be born into the realm of death, then this is the way to do it. Always <clears throat> believe what your ego tells you, your feelings. Believe everything your feelings say to you. Believe your own opinions and views unquestioningly. And then you're, you're born into the realm of death. Marawati. Marawati is the realm of death. <clears throat> so that's where this awakened consciousness here and now there is a sense of observing, isn't there? The puto tamo. Who is it that, that knows? It's nobody. It's not a body. It's not a uh, person. Buddha is not a person. Puto is not, is, you know, I can't, I can't claim that with the thinking mind. I am the Buddha is uh, usually a sign of madness. But there is this puto here and now, this pure state of consciousness with awareness is like this. And from there, whatever you see is Dhamma. All conditions are impermanent. All conditions are not self. 
Oh, Dhamma is not self. So to say I, you know, from the ego level, if I'm, I'm the Buddha, then the Dhamma is mine. This is, this is, uh, this is not Dhamma. <laughs> it's still it's kind of a vicha. So Puto is not self. And it is two syllable word. So it is a creation. But it's for sati sampachanya, it's not for clinging or identity. You see the difference between the if I if I cling to the idea of Bhutto then then sometimes you know, I can delude myself. But it's like a skillful means, like a Buddha Rupa, or uh, uh, the symbols that we have in Theravada Buddhism. They can be used skillfully or can be used stupidly. Now the Buddha was encouraging us not to use conditioned phenomena stupidly. You know, that we're awakening to not to destroy or judge or get rid of or you know criticize the condition the condition phenomena, but to know it, to know it as dhamma rather than as me and mine. So like vipassana, this kind of vipassana practice in they call vipassana is this kind of investigation. Insight, looking into, seeing for yourself, budgetang. In my own practice over the years, I've been through various you know, something will come up and become very important to me. For, you know, just kind of intuitively things arise. And uh, remember, and when I, before Amravati at Chitters, suddenly the, the, uh, the, the form of a stupa became very important to me. I was, uh, you know, the traditional stupa, Buddhist stupa. And I hadn't really paid much attention to I mean, you're certainly aware of them if you live in Buddhist countries, because they're everywhere. But I mean, or you can see them as burial mounds or reliquaries or things like this. But the form is quite interesting, you know, the, the, uh, the set relationship of a square and a circle and a point. Or the word quincunts, which means, you know, five points. The four points, east, uh, north, south, east, and west, and then the point that transcends those four points, like a pyramid. So you see a pyramidal structure, but you've got the, the, the top of it is a point, and then you've got the four corners. And then this, 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 I became really interested in the symbolism of, of numbers and uh, geom geometrical forms. That's basic kind of things in, in our culture. You know, as, as you ever, we've all had courses in geometry. And then the, they call it the quincunt, the pyramidal form the five points, the four on the ground, the earth, fire, water, and air, and the transcendent point, the aware. That's so in terms of uh, the Buddhist interpretation, or my interpretation anyway, is that this point, like the top of a pyramid, or the, the point of a stupa, 
the top point is uh, Puto. So when we're mindful, then we're, <coughs> we're, fr we're looking at the world, at the earth, fire, water in there, north, south, east, and west, which is not judging or, or identifying with it, but having a perspective, that perspective of transcendence or awareness. Transcendence can be a tricky word because it sounds like we're above it all. But if we, you know, this, this is a, my reflection on this, on the stupa, is that, or the pyramid, is that, it, you know, symbolically, it's very, very powerful form. We were in Egypt a few years ago, and you can feel the, uh, this uh, kind of power of this, those ancient pyramids of that particular form. And then I remember going on visits to Oxford and looking at, you know, having these beautiful views of Oxford uh, with all its uh, church steeples, its domes, its kind of magical skyline of Oxford town. You know, it's a kind of ethereal place where everything points upward. And then you notice so much of modern architecture is earthbound, you know, it's square with no points on it. Everything is kind of, all we know is this, is the earth, fire, water, and air, north, south, east, west, kind of getting lost in the four elements, the four directions. We don't know where we're going. We have no perspective. And you think of the, the, like the, the skyline of Oxford always has this sense of, of a kind of ethereal place. Or in Europe, uh, here in, in Europe, the cathedrals, the, the beautiful religious architecture that once was, was probably created out of faith, out of devotion. And so we're, we're living in a time where very, everything's, earth, even though we're trying to, to rocket ourselves into outer space, it's still coming from the me and mine, conquering space, going to Mars and the moon and all the rest. Of it. You know, human achievements. The way we talk about conquering, the Americans have used to talk about conquering the moon. When they were the first ones to to walk on the moon, put the American flag on the moon. We've conquered. And this is, this is the, this is Sakaya Ditti in the, this little shabby form, dares to announce that I've conquered the moon. I'm not dismissing that or, or even criticizing, but just noticing, you know, the Sakya Ditti of our own culture, which, uh, in, which infects us in how we interpret uh, religion or practice, how we see ourselves through these very kind of clunky, conditions. You know, so seeing life through the ego, to me, is depressing. You know, if I have to look at life and experience life through my ego, I mean, it just is such a 
depressing thing to always interpret experience in terms of myself. Putting my feelings first and my opinions first and then and, uh, and trying to impose myself or feel offended if, as you get old, people tend to ignore you. You know, the youth, they don't like old people very much, so they, they tend to, you know, they don't even see. They just see an old fogey. <clears throat> so, this is, you know, old age is, and then, you know, then you can, I could resent, uh, resent that. Fortunately, I'm a bhikkhu, so they, they see, I, they wonder, what the heck is that old man doing in that funny-looking outfit? But they... <laughs> but the, uh, you know, if this was, this was all I experienced in 75 years was an affirmation of self, it would be pretty, pretty depressing for how my ego operates. So that which knows the ego it's like coming from this point and that's what that I equate that to sati panya awake puto tamo seen dhamma if I don't recognize the importance and the value of puto then I then I'm stuck in the rest I'm grounded in the in the you know in the world the conditioned realm kind of being a helpless victim of circumstances. Victim of old age. Victim of political systems, economic systems, social attitudes, other people's views and opinions, on and on like that. It's just, I can't control it, you know. It's, I can't force and make the world you know, those that try to operate from that usually, you know, end up dead. It's hubris, isn't it? It's a kind of human pride and inflated ego of I'm the world emperor, I'm going to dominate and rule the world forever is hubris. Because that is hubris always coming from ignorance and the ego. So then you, you, you know, instead of, though the Buddha encouraged us not to do that, not to come from the ego, but to awaken to the ego, know the ego. It's not uh, getting rid of it, but it's seeing its limitation, knowing its what it is. So Vipassana is, is investigating conditioned phenomena in terms of the three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. Now these are not qualities, they're called characteristics of all conditioned phenomena. So whether it's good or bad, high or low, uh, right or wrong, uh, heavenly or heaven or hell, earthbound, whatever, refined or coarse, uh, anicca dukkanata, it's a way of investigating, even like refined conscious states. We can get quite refined uh, conditions into consciousness. Because this realm that we're living in is, you know, the human possibility of, of uh, refining things. We can live in a very mental world of mental refinements or a very coarse world, just survival, procreation, eating, sleeping, and sex. We can just, you know, operate on, as many people do, operate on that level of just uh, 
pleasure-seeking, squeezing every condition we can to get as much pleasure and happiness out of it. Or this awakening here and now Uh, and this, this, uh, these symbols, symbolic forms like the stupa or the pyramid, it's like these are ancient symbols, pre-Buddhist, in fact. So, I mean, it's not, but it, they do, you know, I became very fascinated by it for several years because it, something was, you know, in me that was somehow, I wasn't seeking some, some kind of interesting subject to study, it just, started arising, my interest in it suddenly arose where before I wasn't, didn't really notice them or care that much about the forms. So in, in your own experience, the things will suddenly become very, maybe that you, before you haven't noticed or given much uh, consideration for, will suddenly become very, you'll find yourself quite interested in it. Now then, living at Chithurst for five years, <clears throat> it was uh, just seeing how, you know, it's a very beautiful place. And so there's a lot, you know, on just the, the earthly level that is very attractive, pleasing to the eye. It's the forest. It's the springtime. It's the South Downs, it's the narrow lanes, it's gentle England, it's uh, pretty, and it's green. And so then, you know, one, one is quite, you know, is very pleasant, I found it very pleasing to the, to the senses. Then the thing that first, when I first saw Amravati, when I came to look at the, this place that was up for school, that was up for sale, the first impression of this place was sky. I had this sense of, this is a, like being under a huge dome. infinity. And so this was, this was the, the kind of reflection I had in coming to Amravati. Like Jitta Viveka, when I named the Chitters Jitta Viveka, the insight then was, uh, since I was involved in establishing monasteries and, you know, training monks and nuns and so forth, I wouldn't have much Gaya Viveka, which I experienced in Thailand, the idea is Gaya Viveka, where you, you go off by yourself and, and uh, practice, take your body away from things to find solitude, physical solitude. Then in Chithurst, you know, I wasn't in a position where I could do that, so I, it became Jitta Viveka. So the solitude of the heart was the insight, the name, named Chitters, Chitta Viveka. And then Amravati, the deathless. And this is my, my way of thinking, you know, why these places have these names. I didn't ask the Sangha whether they agreed or not. <laughs> so here at Amravati, the, 
the um, this sense of spaciousness, of infinity, of immeasurability, to me, just on the eye level, is very strong because we're on the top of a hill. You know, we're on top of the of a Chiltern Hill, and this is uh, and so wherever we look, you know, it's lower than. You know, we aren't looking up at mountains, but we're looking down, and or we look up to the sky, to the empty sky, to the sublime dome above us the ultimate stupa, the ultimate dome uh, of the sky that encompasses everything. And the, the sky, you know, is, is, you know, includes everything. All the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air, north, south, east, and west. And then having to start over again, and just Chithurst was, after five years, was becoming livable, very attached to it, didn't want to leave. But I had to leave, <laughs> because, I mean, just, unless I wanted to just, you know, uh, stay at Chithurst and control the members so that it wouldn't get any bigger. I couldn't very well justify that kind of behavior, so coming here and having to remember insulating these building these wooden buildings and the first winter that we spent here was a nightmare of shivering coldness. There was a blizzard and a cold spell that that encompassed all of Europe, a Siberian freeze, and it was really, we were very poor then, we couldn't afford much heating. But then in terms of practice, it didn't ma really matter. And I remember in winter's retreat of 1985, walking Jongrom outside what is now called the office library area, and they had these these kind of ugly yellow lamps. They created this kind of like urine color, and it, and it had snowed, and it had there was a snowfall and a blizzard, and it was frozen, and we were all shivering with cold walking up and down on the ice with this pissy yellow color and, <laughs> and thinking, it couldn't get much worse than this. <laughs> and then I thought, but I don't care. It doesn't matter. And like, I, mean, I was no longer bound to, to a place or, you know, I want a nice, warm, comfortable place and nice, beautiful, uh, chitterest uh, thing or whatever. I, it didn't matter. In those days, in the, that year, you know, these buildings looked like Siberia, like a Siberian prison camp. But then, uh, using this sound of silence, you know, this, as you begin to value that, then, you know, it how you feel about anything isn't that important. It doesn't take priority over that, you know. This is, this, this infinity, this Amravati, this, the fifth point, the, 
this is where I choose to to be rather than with the conditioned realm. Now it's not a rejection of the conditioned realm, but it it is the ability to no longer be bound, blinded, victimized by the conditioned realm. So one's ability to uh, endure what we don't like and and discomfort and sickness and old age and change and loss and grief and despair and all the rest. These things are all bearable from this point. But on the, if I try to experience life from my ego, then I'm always upset by something. Anxious about the future. Worry. Regret about things of the past and things like this. So you just, you know, you, you begin to see for yourself. Uh, you see the suffering of attachment to conditioned phenomena. And that's where the, the, the Four Noble Truths, this uh, suffering, the causes of suffering, so the Buddha said, I teach two things, suffering and the end of suffering, dukkha and the end of dukkha. So dukkha then is, he, he called that a noble truth. So taking something that none of us like, and want in our lives like dukkha and which everybody experiences. We live in this realm with all its changing conditions that we have very little control over with these bodies that get old, get sick and die and changing societies and, and we have to experience loss and grief of the, as we lose our loved ones and on and on like this calling it a noble truth. What's noble? What's a noble truth about dukkha or suffering? So this word noble, do you know what, what, what does that mean to you, noble? And uh, why would the Buddha call something none of us want we all we spend our lives trying to get rid of it and call it noble truth. Not ultimate truth. No, not the ultimate truth, but a noble truth. A noble truth. <laughs> not the noble truth. <clears throat> so this is, you know, nobility then is, when we, when we you know, it's a word common enough word so that we think we understand it. But when, when I, I've contemplated this word a lot, why would the Buddha call suffering a noble truth? And then, then the thing, you know, the, the second aspect of that first noble truth, you should understand suffering. You should understand dukkha. So like in these three aspects to each truth, there is dukkha, dukkha should be understood, and then the insight, dukkha has been understood. So this is, these three aspects, this is a reflective form that, that the, is very powerful once you begin to appreciate it. The statement, there is, it's intellectual, it's just pointing to something the batibata, this, this word batibata, is investigating, practicing, find out, to understand, should be understood. And that's like just recognizing dukkha is like this. It's clinging to my feelings and my desires and the sense of myself. is like this. 
and then through that, then through that understanding, you 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 have the insight. Dukkha has been understood. So this this is a, a sense of um, but he wait, they call it. It's an insight, an, a kind of knowing, a profound knowing, jnana dasana, knowing. It's not intellectual, just knowing the meanings of the words or having ideas and views about Buddhism anymore. It's like, you know, you know it. Dukkha is, has been understood. And then the, the causes of suffering. Follow that saying. The cause of suffering is the attachment out of ignorance to desire. And so the, the, and so the, the insight is to let go of desire. The practice, the bhati-bhata is letting go of desire. Before you can let go of desire, you have to know what it is. You might like the idea of letting go of desire. You might feel you should let go of all your desires, but that's still sakya ditti, isn't it? And I should let go of all my desires to be a good bhikkhu. A good bhikkhu shouldn't have any desires. I should let go of all of them. It's still, it's still being a bhikkhu is still sakya ditti. And I'm right. You know, it's right in the worldly sense you should. But it's not profound. It's not Dhamma. So then it's... Um, so then these three kinds of desires. Now this is, this is where you, you, know, you really begin to develop sadha, confidence. Because you, you, it's not getting rid of desire, but knowing desire. Examining, getting to know the tastes, clinging to desires like this. Attach, wanting to get rid of desires like this is another desire. I want to get rid of my desires is another desire. So on the ego level, there's no way you can deal with it. You know, it's just, you go around in circles, catch 22 situations. I want to get rid of the desire to get rid of the desire to get rid of desire. <laughs> and one can go around and make it, if you want to carry it to absurdity, you could spend your life saying things like that. But this, uh, this uh, is a way of examining desire, gamma danha, sense desire. Desire that arises through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Bhavadana, desire for becoming. Vipavadana, desire to get rid of. So, you know, it's like to say you shouldn't have any desires because you're, you're samanas. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Because we hear that, if we hear that from the ego level, we're going to feel total despair because we don't get rid of it. We understand it. We know it. We know what it feels like, its taste, its power. We know how attachment to these desires takes us over and we, we're born again into the, into the death realm. So if we're born into the death realm, it's because of attachment, a heedless attachment to desire. Even the desire, like suppression of desire, is a desire. So that's still the death realm, trying to suppress desires, reject them, annihilate them, is you're still born again into the death realm. So you have these bariati, bati 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 weighty in Pali, and this is 
interesting sequence. It's a reflective form. The Bariati is a statement. You get the Bariati from the scriptures, from the suttas. That's the Buddhist Pali tradition, Bariati tradition. Then Bhati Bhata. is the second aspect of each noble truth. So the Buddha tells you the problem, you know, the Bariyati is the, gives you the, the, the you know, the, the problem what, and what to do about it, the prescription for dealing with the causes of suffering. The prescription then, the Bhattibhata side is letting go of desire. And then the insight is desire has been let go of, but he waity. So this is, these are skillful ways of thinking, you know, of, of reflecting on experience, because it's not about, it's not cultural, it's not my culture, it's not about being European or, or our values in the West and British values and and all of this in the modern society or anything. It's about, you know, it's, it's not about culture anymore. Not about being Thai or Sinhalese or European or American. It's not those, those identities, you know, fall away when you see See the attachment of the ego, the ego, the sakaditi is bound into these limitations of identity with with your country, with your nationality, with your gender, with your class, race, position, social position. So in this way, you know, we're, we, we see through these, you know, these, these kind of attachments we have through cultural conditioning as we explore and investigate in terms of noble truth. So like this nobility of, of looking at suffering rather than just trying to get run away from it. Like the Batuchina, the unenlightened human being is always blaming their suffering on somebody else. And then, I'm suffering because of you. And then, uh, or I'm suffering because I was born in poverty, I didn't get all the opportunities that the wealthy have. And my mother didn't love me and so forth, so I'm suffering because of all kinds of abuse in the past. And so this is, this is Bhutuchana thinking, this is Sakya Ditti. Not to deny that, because, you know, you, nobody, we all have our memories of being mistreated or whatever in the past. But instead of the, the noble Aryan truth is we, we study it, we investigate suffering. We're no longer blaming it on somebody else, something else, but it's become an Aryan truth, a noble truth. With, Suddenly, dukkha, the most ordinary, banal experience that every human being can recognize, nothing esoteric or subtle in any way, becomes a noble truth. Well, that's amazing, you think. Putting it into that category, taking the most banal, common human experience and calling it a noble truth. So then this understanding, you see, is instead of rejecting, running away, blaming it on somebody else, you understand, you know, this, this is it. This suffering, this feeling of poor me or my feelings and I'm a victim of circumstances or whatever. Whether it's just whether it's physical or mental, emotional, whatever. And then you investigate the causes of suffering, get to know, 
be an expert on dunha or desire. Be the knower of desire, not the desire itself. And once you see that, the suffering of attaching to desire out of ignorance, then the insight comes, let go of it. There's no point in hanging on to desire. So it's not getting rid of it. It's not like, you know, annihilating desire, but not, don't grasp it anymore. Once you know what it is, the insight, your wisdom will say, let go of it. And then the, through letting go of the three kinds of desire, then we have the insight, bhati-veti, the uh, insight level. Desire has been relinquished, let go of. So this nobility then is, you know, the pusillanimous individual is... Um, you know, doesn't know how, doesn't, doesn't understand it at all. Doesn't, you know, just tries to find happiness or blame the suffering on somebody else. But the Aryan, the Samana, then is awakened to desire and the, and the result of attaching to desire. Dana Ubadana Bawa, becoming, born again into the death realm. Oh, endless cycle of birth and death. If we, if we have no perspective, no way of, of looking at it from this point of non-criticism, non-identity, which is the fifth point, isn't it? At Barobador in Java, the, uh, the amazing Buddhist complex, the stupas, uh, interesting, like it has these different levels, and you, on the very ground level is, the, is all these uh, base reliefs of people, you know, doing just ordinary vulgar activities. And all kinds of people having sex and buying and selling and fighting and quarreling and wrangling and so forth. And then as you, and as you go up the different levels, I think there's seven or so, the, the, uh, it, they become more ethereal, the base reliefs. And then to the top, then this is the, the Quinn Cooks, the fifth point. It's empty. It has no form. So, in, in uh, this is you know this is ancient wisdom that that you know obviously a place like Barovador were were you know were expressions of this physical expressions in stone of of this 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 uh, beautiful form of the stupa or the pyramid. Well, we can't rely on just uh, external forms, but they do remind us, isn't it? They do, when we look at the stupa here, that's from Barobad, that's from a copy of a Barobador stupa. It's this, <coughs> this uh, way of reminding yourself, seeing it in terms of not as you don't have to look at it aesthetically or like it or dislike or anything like that, but 
the form itself. Where are you now? You know, you're on the, the ground level, eating, sleeping, dying. Or just through this simple imminent um, remembering, Kramer, look, sati, here and now. It's as immediate as that. So I say, you're on the ground level, poor me, nobody understands me, nobody loves me. Me and my problems and old man like me. <laughs> Body packing up, poor me, kind of thing. Or feeling angry, resentful. Or suddenly I see the stupa or the Buddha Rupa and then I... Sati. Sampachanya. Now over the 42 years of my monastic life, this is what I've done, this getting so familiar with Sati Sampachanya. So it's, it's a stronger, you know, the, the poor me or, or the Sakya Ditti level doesn't have much power because it, it doesn't mean anything. It still operates. I can still, I still think and feel things. But I don't believe in it anymore. I don't see it in terms of me and mine. But from Sati Sampajanya, from awareness, it is what it is. It's not trying to, to whitewash it or, or call it something else. Not about self deception, but it's recognition, nor of the world, loka vidu. So, this is a offering for this morning, this is to, you know, how to use the structures, the tradition, the concepts, the icons of this form. They're Therefore, awakened awareness, not for attachment, not for projecting all kinds of things onto them, your own views about them, but using them for, because we do need to, to remember, because the world is powerfully, has a powerful effect on our consciousness. These bodies are relentless. You know, stuck in a human body for 74 years. Relentless challenge to come to terms with, with such a sensitive form. But that's where this awakened attention to it, like the quincunx, the fifth point, doesn't deny anything, it includes. So in terms of, of just being a hum, human individual at this very moment, then everything I'm feeling, thinking, physically, mentally, sensually, belongs. But I'm seeing it now from puto tamo rather than from sakyaditi, from me and mine. So you see it in terms of, you see Dhamma rather than, than uh, my emotions, my memories, my feelings. So again, you, you know, just to see the difference of the subject-object relationship out of the illusory subject-object, which is Sakya Ditti and my body and my feelings, to Puto tamo sankho supatipano.